Hey guys, in this week's Casually Criterion episode, we are going to review On the Waterfront. But before that, we'll also talk about Knock at the Cabin and Paul T. Goldman. So, join us! Casual Cinecast, powered by Cinelinks. My name is Chris, and with me as always is Mike. Mike, in honor of On the Waterfront and Marlon Brando, what is your favorite method of acting? You know, the method, which is like the Stella Adler v- way of doing things, or the Meisner? What, what, do you, what do you think there? You know, like you got William H. Macy or, or Marlon Brando, which one's best? <laughs> well, I'm not familiar with these styles or what they what those words mean <laughs> but if you're asking me who is the better actor between marlon brando and william h macy yeah uh gee i don't know i would say here's here's what i would say okay. i don't know anything about the methods mm-hmm. but i know that brando's method whatever that whatever you call that is to not learn your lines and be really unprofessional so that sure. was a, a yeah. great one of the greatest talents ever, I would say. Whatever William H. Macy's method is, seems more professional and kind. Easier to, to yeah, easier to get along with. I, I <laughs> yeah. agree with that. Uh <laughs> Justin is also with us. Um I, I apologize for this crazy question, but uh Justin, what is what is your favorite uh, acting method? <laughs> Miming. Miming? Just a mime. Yeah. Mime. That, uh, what is, is that a method? Uh sure. Um just totally silent. The, the great history of miming um, and how people hate it. But, uh, you know, like uh, Charlie Chaplin, I was kind of a mime, you know, like a Bus- yeah. the Buster Keaton. All those silent guys are kind of mimes. Yeah. So the silent I, clowns. I, yeah. Silent, sad clowns. <laughs> yeah. That, that's also my answer because I don't know that much about the other uh, acting methods. I mean, I know Meisner and Stanislavski as, as words. But not necessarily as yeah, like what their they definitions. Mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, what does it mean to practice those words? It's all really complicated. Meisner is more about being like in the moment and not necessarily bringing like a character in with you. I mean, there is character work and stuff like that. But then, like Stella Adler and the Stanislavski, the method acting, the Marlon Brando way, is like all about being in the character and also like calling up your past memories. And I may be mixing these up myself. It's been a while since I've had a class on these. Oh, things. like, like Jim Carrey when he was doing man on the moon. Yes. That would be method acting or like Daniel day yeah. Lewis. And the method way is definitely like the less professional of the ways I would say, you know, like a lot it of times, it seems like the yeah. more difficult to, to even have to do. put up with. Way. I, yeah. <laughs> well, I think, I think method gets thrown around most commonly with, people who do it to an extreme like you know like sure. jared letter was the joker or daniel day lewis making people carry him around or whatever but i don't think it necessarily has to mean that no but there is it it, it is a little bit more where like you are trying to inhabit another character does that make sense yeah where, and using your own memories and trying to pull that i mean i guess that's what all acting is but the, you know like meisner is a little bit more about like bringing yourself to the character as opposed to letting the character take over you uh, right. is kind of the different ways of acting. So like William H. Macy is definitely all in that Meisner school of acting and uh, David Mamet. Um, it's interesting when you <laughs> kind of look at it and especially in the seventies, there's like these three different schools of acting like Al Pacino even falls in kind of that, like uh, Stella Adler, you know, and there's uh, kind of like almost these battling schools. Uh, very interesting. Maybe one day, We'll uh, read that. There's a book about it. Um, it's yeah. pretty good. And we'll read that and talk all about all the different schools of acting and what they mm-hmm. mean for movies, because actually they generally change the way we watch movies and the way people act and stuff. So anyways, yeah. uh, that was a long enough intro for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's move on. All right. Well, if this is your first time listening, this is a casually criterion episode, which we like to do usually every other episode. Uh, where we review a film from the Criterion Collection that is voted on by our listeners via our Twitter page. Uh, Before we get into the main review, we will be doing our usual News on the March, where we talk about what we've been watching. So if you haven't seen the movie, you can still listen for a bit, 
Then we move into the Casualty Criterion Review. It's all time-stamped this week on the waterfront, spine number 647. That's right. And as Mike said, we put the poll for the Criterion film out on our Twitter account, which is at Casual Cinecast. So give us a follow there so you can vote in the poll and help determine what we review. You can also send us messages or questions about the movies to that uh, that account or to casualcinemedia at gmail.com. And then, of course, if you haven't done so already, you like the show, give us a five-star review on iTunes. Give us a thumbs up on Spotify. Um, give us a high five in our DMs. Yeah, wherever. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm game. Yeah. Please and thank you. Okay. And let's move on. News in the okay. march. Here we go. Let's go. All right, we're here in News on the March, and first up, Mike, I think you're the only one that's seen our first item, so give it to us. All right, so recently, this weekend, I saw Knock at the Cabin, which is the new film from M. Night Shyamalan. Yeah, and it stars Dave Bautista and Jonathan Groff and others. Ron Weasley. <laughs> yeah, Ron Weasley. Um, Rupert Grint? Yeah. Yeah, Rupert Grint. Yeah. This is a film that is based on a book, I believe, called... Correct. Yeah, Cabin at the End of the World. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Which I think is a better title, if you ask me, but... You and a lot of other people. <laughs> But from what I understand is there are some differences. So I'm, I'm, if I were a big fan of the book, I would maybe want them to call this something else too. <laughs> but what I would say is this is a film that, <laughs> like pretty much every M. Night Shyamalan movie, I appreciate a lot of what is happening here. And I also think that maybe dialogue is the worst thing about the about the movie, it's not bad, but you know, if you've seen old or if you've seen his movies that he's been putting out recently, I think you know what I'm talking about. Where there's flashes of of like brilliance, and then there's flashes of like uh, laziness in writing. Sometimes, you know, I don't know. I think script is not M Night Shyamalan's strong suit, right. and I think that continues with this movie. That said, though, I think this is better than his average movie. For the performances alone. I think, first of all, Dave Bautista is doing some really great stuff here. This is probably the most he's gotten to shine and be different. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think Dave Bautista, because he's such a funny guy, kind of gets roped into comedies a lot or comedic roles where he gets to be silly. Mm -hmm. But here, there's no silliness. It's it's very serious and um, menacing and sympathetic. And I think he's the heart and soul of the movie, to be honest with you, and kind of raises this above, I think, would have otherwise been a, a pretty standard movie. But um, all, all in all, I recommend it, but with the caveat of it's an M. Night Shyamalan movie, and if you've seen one of those, you kind of know the weird tone I'm talking about, I think. I mean, sure. does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, <laughs> I think that description actually... I recommend it, but it's an M. Night Shyamalan movie, and you kind of know what you're in for, uh, you know, given the last 10 years of his work or whatever. I, I kind of like him sometimes, and then sometimes, you know, I'm negative on him. So, yeah. Yeah. I think his stuff is always a mixed bag. Like, I, yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen some of the, you know, stuff that he first came on the scene with, but I, I can't think of a movie of his that is just like a, this, this perfect like 10 out of 10 movie or it's really great and I have nothing bad to say about it. Like, it's always, you know, there's always a like, criticism, I think, to mix in with it. Like this, it's never perfect. Sure. I think I'll stand by Signs. I loved Signs so much. Yeah. Uh, but I know you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, other than that, I, I think I'm kind of there with you. I think yeah. Signs is the closest I come to loving an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Yeah, is, sure. I, I guess it would be signs are unbreakable, but I don't know how you feel about unbreakable. I think unbreakable is good. I'm one of the few people who thinks that split and glass kind of make unbreakable better than it was on its own. Right. Okay. But I don't think I'm. I, I think based on how glass went, a lot of people maybe don't feel that way. Yeah, I mean, right. I, what I was about to say, you asked how I felt about unbreakable or how we did. 
And I was like, well, it doesn't feel like it's a finished movie. You know, like you have to watch. It doesn't have a conclusion as it, yeah, like, that's true. as itself. So you have to, I mean, I'm not a satisfying one at least. So the other two ha- kind of have to go with it. But I do like Unbreakable. I think there's a lot of good stuff to like in Unbreakable. But once yeah. again, it's a mixed bag, <laughs> you know. Uh, yep. So, yeah, I just think I always have that expectation going into his film. So maybe when it's more good than bad I, or, or things I don't like, you know, it, it tends to then be elevated in my mind, right? Like I'm right. taken by surprise. I'm like, oh, okay, well, this is quite good maybe sure i think he has that capability of going either way and and unpredictable and sometimes it can go back and forth within the span of one scene (laughs) yeah (laughs) you know what i mean where it's like something like the camera movement or the blocking is something like like visually striking and really interesting and then someone opens their mouth and says something or like uh, did you guys see old yes not yet oh well then i can't go but old had a lot of that too where it's like absolutely it's like uh, something really disturbing, and you're like, "Man, that's horrifying and, and great." And then it's just like, "Oh, I would have maybe cut down that a little bit because that kind of ruined it." I don't, you know, I don't know. So it's like it's yeah. a weird thing with his movies. But w- what I would say is, at the end of the day, I think there's more good than bad here. But and I can't get into this too much. Uh, I wasn't a big fan of the third act. I'm really interested in this part of it, too, because I'm pretty sure this is where it diverges the most from the book. Yeah, from what I understand, it does. And I don't know. Uh, I guess I'll I'll keep it there. But I, I will say that if it had ended slightly differently, I could have left a little bit more high on it. And it, it would have been my favorite M. Night Shyamalan movie of recent years. But as it stands now, I think I like old a little bit more. Oh, wow. But... Hmm. But Dave Bautista as the lead or as like the I guess he's not really the lead, but Dave Bautista's performance and the acting in this one is just all around better than usually. Uh, I think it's it's mainly the script that kind of lets them down dialogue wise, but the performances are all great and everyone's everyone's hearts in it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think this is a little divergent from the movie, but there's going to be a great book that comes out about M. Night Shyamalan uh, because he's had such an interesting career as he has gone through, you know, I think there's a moment and it's like around the lady in water time where he could have been reined in and perhaps put out some good stuff or I I don't know if it was, would have been a good thing for him to be reined in. But I think there was a moment where he decided he was going to go off on his own and make his own movies and finance his own stuff. And, uh, I think a lot of your complaints could have been reined in if he wasn't financing his own movies, if that makes sense. Uh, Like if he had like producers that was telling him, no, you know, like this is silly or whatever. He's got this idea that he's an auteur, which he is, you know, he puts out his own stuff, but like where his ideas are better than everybody else's, I think sometimes, or at least that's my perception of him. Well, uh, here's the thing. Not many people get to do that. And, and for, all the bad things that people say about M. Night Shyamalan. The man takes some big, bold swings, sure. and he is seemingly fearless. I, I would agree, yeah. And I kind of don't want that to be reined in. Yeah. Well, you know, like, I, don't, I mean, I see what you're saying. Like, yeah, maybe if he, like, listened to some notes and was like, you know, maybe take another pass at the script. Yeah, maybe it would have resulted in better movies. But I don't know, man. There's there's something about the fearlessness and the 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 bravery on display of like the the big wild boldness that and it works. no one else really is doing. Yeah, you know, it, you have yeah. a, that's a really good point. And like I kind of rethinking my, I mean, like I wish he took some notes, <laughs> you know, like but I don't necessarily want him reined in by studios. I don't want him making Marvel movies, right? Uh, yeah. So, but I wish he took a little bit of notes, but I I do think you're like betting on himself and putting out these movies uh, and the fact that they make money, you know, like uh, whether I, you know, think they're the greatest movies ever or not. That's not the point. I think they're decent and and they're making money and they're individual movies that aren't IP, you know, Uh, I guess it's based on a book. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of IP, but yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It might be less interesting if if he's reined in. 
that's true. So good point. And, yeah, so, but anyway, yeah. that's I guess where I will leave it. Knock at the cabin. I recommend it with the caveat that I don't really love any of M. Night Shyamalan's movies, but I still recommend a good portion of them. <laughs> Except for Signs. You love Signs. I think Signs <laughs> is the closest I come to loving one, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you could settle for Signs yeah. Yeah, if you had to. <laughs> signs is a good movie. I will, I will, I will rest it there. <laughs> okay, um, okay. Now, the next thing on the docket is something that I have not seen. But you two have seen uh, at least some of. I don't know if you've seen the same amount, but uh, why don't you kick it off, Justin? Sure. So we're going to be talking about the, I think it's Peacock original series, Paul T. Goldman. Yep. And yeah, I, I think it's a, it's only three episodes long. Am I right about that, Chris? No, it's it's six episodes long. What? <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> I thought I looked ahead at the episode count and I was like, okay, only three. This isn't bad. Um, okay, well, I've, I have seen one episode of this. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess to try to say what it's about is... And actually, you know what? I haven't looked up anything about this, so I don't know if this is a genuine real person. Is Paul T. Goldman a real person? Yes. Okay. Well, Okay, well then, what it's about, this, this real guy named Paul T. Goldman... Uh, has this crazy story and he's written a screenplay and a book about this crazy story um, of getting divorced and kind of uncovering that his ex-wife has some sort of crime ring or something like that and this isn't a spoiler because this is all laid out within like the first couple minutes of the first episode and (laughs) he's approached this uh, the director of the series whose name I don't know off the top of my head do you know Uh, I can find out. Keep going. Okay. And so what they do is they, they kind of merge his screenplay with a documentary about this guy trying to tell his story uh, via screenplay, I guess. Um, So it's kind of a half documentary, um, half reenactment, but shot like a movie or like a TV series. Mm -hmm. Um, And it, it just kind of goes back and forth between the two and the, the real Paul T. Goldman insists on playing himself in the reenactment sections and uh, he's a bad actor and sure. they, they word for word verbatim verbatim use his screenplay that he wrote. So it's not a good screenplay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and therein lies the comedy, I think. Um, plus this guy is, I don't know. He's kind of a, to me, he's a s- slightly more irritating version of like Woody Allen. <laughs> oh wow! And because uh, <laughs> uh, I mean I like Woody Allen. Uh, if you in a vacuum in his movies, like as an actor, right, um, sure. and as a character, uh, I I like him to an extent. But I can certainly understand that he could be a bit grating and um, a bit annoying. I think this guy massively jumps over that line into into being <laughs> annoying and weird. Um, but yeah, it's it's like a comedy series and um i've watched the first episode and i am i just could not tell whether i liked it or disliked it more because i was so back and forth throughout it um and i don't know if the humor was landing for me but um chris you have seen more than i have so do yeah, you want to talk about it I've, I've finished it um yeah so jason walliner I, I believe that's how you pronounce his name he is the director of of the show um he did things like borat as well um the, the of, sequel to borat not was the, it the sequel? original okay yeah uh, but he's done a lot of things like this similar to kind of in this way in this vein at least uh it's really yeah, interesting directed be- some nathan for you episodes yeah stuff. so yeah. okay uh, so the other thing about this Paul T. Goldman character is that so he, all this stuff happened to him, right? And he wrote a book about it and it's about his wife, like uh, left him or he discovers that she's got like some sort of crime ring. And there's this question, and I don't know how far it dives into it in the first episode, but how much of his story is true? Uh, and, and that's so he's, they're filming mm-hmm. this episode. He also has a, 
and I don't think these are necessarily spoilers either, but a tendency to get taken advantage of. Um, so there's all these things that kind of start to... Like, the first episode just barely scraped the surface, and it's it's all, you know, it's really about making the movie, right? And, but as, we, as you go further into the show, it kind of, like like an onion peels back all these different layers um and i think ultimately it's about like the truths or the things not the truths but the, the things that we tell ourselves like our worldview you know like how we build up our worldview and then mm -hmm. how sometimes we fool ourselves into believing a certain worldview um and, and and it made me uncomfortable how much <laughs> I saw myself in Paul T. Goldman or how, how I was worried that like, oh, man, you know, like, am I telling myself the truth when I go about my life, my daily life? Like in. Is my worldview true is kind of how I, I was taking it. it. It's really funny. And then it's really touching and kind of like. <sighs> weird at the very end it and I, without giving anything away it, it's really tough but you know parts of the story perhaps aren't true <laughs> uh like maybe she didn't have a a crime ring but maybe she still betrayed him in some way um and, and things like that so it's really interesting as he kind of confronts that himself um because i think he's open to these things um he he Man, it's really hard to tell. I would recommend it though. That's that's what I'll say. Is if especially if you liked, and that's why I, I thought, especially Justin, um, because you liked uh, what was the not Nathan for you, but the most recent one that he uh, the rehearsal the rehearsal, uh, because I think that there's a lot of similarities in in, in both of these, um, where it's kind of awkward and makes you feel a little weird. Um, there's none of this, none of the kids stuff that like Mike had objections to uh in the rehearsal so everybody's like adult in this <laughs> so there's not like mm -hmm. but there's still these like weird moments and i think weird truths that you can only get from like a reality type show uh and what i'll say is it's close to a reality show but i came away a lot of times i watch a reality show i i come away feeling empty like i ate up like a bag of m&ms or something you know like i i don't feel good <laughs> anymore but like mm -hmm. when i watch this I, I felt satisfied and I felt like I needed to think about it and question things. So in that way, mm. it is worth a uh, while. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, you said this in text to me that it reminds you of a reality show. And I don't, I mean, okay, I've only seen one episode, so grain of salt with this, I guess. But like, I mean, only reality in, in the sense that documentaries are real is what I saw. You know, I don't, it didn't feel like a, reality reality show it just felt like a documentary to me where they mixed in um his fictional screenplay well, being a, shot a, in, a salaciousness in that. or uh sorry to interrupt but there's a like over the topness that you get from reality shows or that i get in the character of paul t goldman you know like where we have these cameras on him and especially the first episode is like how weird is this guy he you know how awkward is he he wants to make his own um you know movie about himself you know he goes around telling everybody his story uh and that over the topness is the part that was kind of like the reality show does that make sense yeah, because i guess in the in the sense that he is like a reality star where he's performing for the camera and, yeah, and you you're you kind of wondering, looking for it yeah like hamming it up how much is he how much is he hamming it up and how much of this is real you know like and, and that's kind of kind of what kept me going to a certain extent um mm. and i think ultimately it is a a character study into paul t goldman and who he is and uh things such as that i, I don't know i i found it really interesting yeah. mike do you have any interest in watching this or uh how do you feel after listening to me ramble i mean i'm interested a little bit i guess first of all this is a terrible title for a, a show <laughs> If you want the show to sound interesting at all, just like a, a boring name, I don't know, you know, bad, bad idea. But <laughs> sure, yeah, I mean, maybe. I don't. Yeah. I'm not going to subscribe to a new service. Sure, I could say that. <laughs> but right. to comment on something you said earlier, I liked uh, the rehearsal, but my overall problem with Nathan Fielder is that, unlike 
other people like Sasha Baron Cohen or whatever, or the jackass guys. It seems like uh, Nathan for you or Nathan Fielder, his brand is to like put normal people in uncomfortable situations where like he's kind of punching down, it seems. Okay. Instead of like exposing crappy people like Sasha Baron Cohen does with Borat or something. You know what I mean? It sure. seems like people who don't deserve it are often the butt of the joke. I can see that. And, and and I think that's part of what I was afraid of when I first started watching Paul T. Go- Goldman. I thought he was the butt of the joke, especially in the first episode. Yeah. And that, maybe that's the reality. Maybe you were able to put into focus what I found was the reality part of it. But I, I also would say you really have to watch the whole thing. Um, it, it really, play, you know, because it's it plays out over you know lots of years um, because they, they started filming it before the pandemic. In fact, the, one of the interesting things is he was so confident, you know, he like just tweeted at all these different directors uh, in order to try. He's like, hey, check out my life, you know, at David Fincher, you know, uh, you should make a movie <laughs> out of it. And it's just happened to be that Jason Wolliner like actually responded and was like, hey, this seems like a good idea. But like, let's do it this way where we we make a reality show about uh making the movie and in fact eventually it catches up where they don't know where it's going to go to like it gets canceled by nbc or something like that maybe not nbc since it eventually ends up on peacock but it gets canceled by showtime at some point uh and then yeah. peacock picks it up or it got canceled by hulu uh, something along those lines so hmm. all that starts to play into it as well it, it, it's really interesting and i think ultimately the the character study part of it um and the reflection that we see uh, that i saw uh is what I yeah. found compelling. So I'm gathering that, like, from, I, I guess, uh, from the first episode, things change sure. so yeah. much that, like, like unless you just hate the first episode <laughs> or something and can't stand it, you should keep watching. Yeah, because... You know, like, if you were at all, if you were at all any part of you in, enjoying or intrigued by the first episode... Yes. Um, and, and because it, it is so much different because like the first episode is let's make this movie. And then as you move along, we start to reveal more and more things. You're still making the movie, but about his story. And we kind of dive into the real characters in his story. Uh, and he kind of explains yeah. things and we meet like his first wife. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, sure. you know, um, we meet like the real one as opposed to the one in the movie or uh, stuff like that. So we start meeting people around him and, and realizing more and more things about him. So, you know, I, like I said, it's like the first layer, you know, this is the first episode. In fact, what we should do is, uh, you know, after you've finished watching it, we can check back in because I, I'd be really fascinated. And I mean, you, you may not like it, but uh, I'd be fascinated, yeah. in, fascinated in hearing why you don't like it. So, yeah, I would say like the first episode was not enough for me to immediately watch the next one. Or to even really think about when I would watch the next one. Sure. But talking to you is different. That yeah. changes it. Yeah. And I'd heard so, other things about it, which is what kept me going. Otherwise, I think I may have felt similar to you. Yeah. Um, and I think I watched like two to three episodes the first night, you know. So I, I was, once you do that, you're kind of invested. So. Right. Yeah. If you're halfway, you might as well. Yeah. See, and I thought I was a third of the way. <laughs> yeah you're like this when is only you, three episodes and you still weren't sure where you're going to keep going <laughs> yeah you said six earlier and i was like oh i don't know yeah but okay i'll keep going for you thanks pal <laughs> yeah all right well, well do we have anything else we want to say about paul t goldman nope not i no if all you've right. seen it let me know what you guys think that's for sure yeah okay and with that, I think it's time to move into our casually criterion review for On the Waterfront, starting now. How much you weigh, Slip? And you weighed 168 pounds. You were beautiful. You could have been another Billy Khan. Uh, skunk, we got you for the manager. He brought you along too fast. It wasn't him, Charlie. It was you. Remember that night in the garden? You came down my dressing room and said, Kid, this ain't your night. We're going for the price on Wilson. You remember that? This ain't your night. 
my night, I could have taken Wilson apart. So what happens? He gets the title shot outdoors in a ballpark, and what do I get? A one-way ticket to Palookaville. You was my brother, Charlie. You should have looked out for me a little bit. You should have taken care of me just a little bit so I wouldn't have to take them dies for the short end money. Well, I had some bets down for you. You saw some money. You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. Let's face it. It was you, Charlie. Okay. Okay. I tell him I couldn't find you. Tell the one he won't believe. Here. You take this. You're gonna need it. Yo, you pull over. All right. So as always with our Criterion films, there. Older movies, they've been out for a while. This one's been out for, I don't know, 70 years, roughly, almost. <laughs> <laughs> so we will not be doing our usual spoiler-free section we do on our newer releases. So we're going to jump straight into talking about On the Waterfront. We might spoiler, spoil it from the first second, so consider this your spoiler alert. Uh, if you uh, have not seen On the Waterfront, pause the podcast now, go watch it, and come back and finish listening. Yes. All right, so... On the Waterfront was directed by Elia Kazan. It stars Marlon Brando, Carl Malden, Lee J. Cobb, and Eva Marie Saint. The IMDb synopsis says, An ex-prize fighter turned Jersey Long Shoreman struggles to stand up to his corrupt union boss, including his older brother, oh, bosses, including his older brother, as he starts to connect with the grieving sister of one of the syndicate's victims. Whew. Yeah, wordy, yeah, but accurate. We should nominate you for uh, best audiobook for the Grammys <laughs> next year. Yeah, after yeah, that, that synopsis I messed up on, but didn't go back to correct. Yeah, it's probably why you won't win. You'll just get the nomination. Yeah. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, okay, so who wants to kick us off? Have we all seen this movie before? Who chose this? First of all, I Justin think I did. did. And okay, I have seen it before. Okay, well then you can start us off since you love it so much. <laughs> okay, did well, Chris? Have you seen it before? Uh, this was actually my first time, um, but I, I'd seen oh, really? a lot of clips. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Mike and you—you'd you'd seen it before, I'm pretty sure. Yes, this is my sec- uh, second or third time to see it. I can't remember, but yeah, definitely I think at least my the third. second. I think I watched it once on my own, once in a film class, and then once now. Yeah, that sounds yesterday. right. Um, so I'm gonna say it's my third time. Yeah. But it's cool. my first time in well over a decade. Yeah, same. And that was the reason that I picked it, was just because it's one I've been wanting to revisit. I've had the Criterion Blu-ray for so long, and it was still in its shrink wrap. And <laughs> that was making me sad. So I was able to bust open that shrink wrap and pull it out and watch it last night. And um, I've always remembered this this movie very fondly. And I think it's still great. I, uh, you know, watching good movies again only makes them better. So uh, I think it's even better than I did the last time I watched it. Um, obviously, the performances are really great. Uh, I love the way that this movie uh, looks. It kind of, I guess, what when I think back to those the films from this era, they feel a lot more studio driven to me. So. This one actually being shot on location, it has a different feel than most movies uh, that I think of from this time period. For sure, um, yeah. The the nineteen fifties or early nineteen fifties, and um, there's a grit to this movie. Yeah, yeah, and you can tell, and you can feel that it was shot um, on location in a lot of places. You know, like the rooftop sequences and um, some of the stuff in the church and like outside, um, where you can see across the water and like the skyline and the distance and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, so I and I think that that gives this movie an edge uh, that'll always uh, stick out to me. Uh, what what I think stuck out to me the most this time, just having seen so many more films in the, like the decade or so since I last watched this, 
um, was a, a true appreciation for what Brando is doing in this movie. Like, I don't know if it's just me, but watching it, he was just on a different level than everybody else in this movie. And not even, it's not necessarily good or bad. It's just, there's, you can, to me, you can literally see the difference between uh, the, the sort of stagey Hollywood acting of old. um, And then, Brando and what was to come from that, like the natural acting. And, um, you know, as good as the story is, I was good this time. I was very like hyper focused on his performance and was just kind of blown away by it this time. And uh, otherwise, you know, I think it's a, it's an interesting story. It's, it's a great movie in my opinion. Just one of the, one of the all time greats for me. And, uh, I'll leave it there for now. Uh, Chris, I'm actually most. I'm going to go to you because I'm most curious. This is your first time, yeah. So I want to hear what you think. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up uh, performances uh, because I watched the scene in the taxi cab. Um, that I could have been con- a contender scene so many times for like different acting classes and stuff that I took. You know, that, mm-hmm. which is probably one of the reasons why I haven't seen it till now because I've seen a lot of clips from this. I just, you know, I I never actually watched the whole thing right um mm-hmm. it's really interesting and the, the reason well one of the times i watched it was because marlon brando of course is this method acting and you're right he is great uh and then uh especially in the, the i could have been a contender scene uh he's playing against uh, rod steiger who is meisner and about being in the moment and you know like doing his own thing you know, like as opposed to bringing in the character and it's the story i always always told uh, and this is why what I kind of focused on as I was watching it, um, for better or for worse, was that like Marlon Brando, they f- they filmed the tex- taxi scene, they filmed all of Marlon Brando's side. Uh, he left, and then they just Rod Steiger had to film his side of it by himself. And his thing was like, I'm just going to out act him, you know, like uh, from my half of it, um, mm. which is really interesting because I didn't think that there was that much without Marlon Brando in it, like on his half of it. But I. Uh, he is really good in this. Um, but that was always like, because Marlon Brando had to work his way into being into character, but Rod Steiger could be, it was always about the acting methods. Like the Rod Steiger ver- acting method was a lot better than the Marlon Brando one because you could just be in character whenever, you, like kind of like at a drop of a hat as opposed to having to work your way into it like Marlon Brando did. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's nothing against Marlon Brando. He's he was, He's great in this movie. Anyways, but ultimately... Uh, just overall, I I think this is a really <laughs> a really great movie. Um, all of them. Carl M- Muldoon is is really good in this. Uh, Carl, what? What's it? Would you call him Muldoon? M- Muldoon. How do you pronounce Maldon. his name? Muldoon. Muldoon. How it's spelled? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, whoever chose that was wrong. But anyways, uh, <laughs> it's actually not his real name according to IMDb's trivia section. He had to change it to Carl Muldoon. Uh, was it Muldoon first? No, it's like uh, it's like a European name. Oh, uh, hmm. interesting. Anyways, uh, there's a lot of stuff that I really love about this movie. Um, the way it looks, like I love those dock scenes. You know, um, I thought those were really well shot. Um, and the black and white. I, I the other thing that kind of piqued my interest. Um, Justin, you can maybe elaborate a little bit later, but it's a different aspect ratios and how that changes things too. You know, you said on the Criterion Edition that there are several mm-hmm. different aspect ratios, and I'll, I'd be interested in hearing. Uh, I know you didn't yeah. watch the movie three times, but you saw like the three. You saw a little bit of each of them, so yeah. Um, yeah. What, the, what was that? Like? I'll dive into that, but general impressions. Maybe not the place to dive into the different yeah. aspect ratios. All right, Mike. <laughs> Uh, what did you think? Uh, yeah, well, to sound like a broken record, I'll just, you know, kind of uh, quickly repeat a lot of what you guys said. Obviously, Brando is really good in this, uh, as is Carl Malden, as is Steiger, you know, as is everybody. There's not a weak link here. Even Marie Saint, uh, she won an Academy Award for this movie. Mm -hmm. Elia Kazan, I've always been a fan of his films. I know he... Uh, as time has gone on, is sort of a controversial figure in Hollywood because of the choices he made during the, you know, uh, 
House Un-American Activities Committee days, but which this movie kind of reflects on. Yeah. Yeah. But Kazan is just a, a great director. He's made so many great movies. Yeah. Agreed. Mm-hmm. And this one is no exception. Like Justin said, I think there's um, the filming locations really adds like a grit to this film that is um, not present in a lot of Hollywood studio films of this era. And man, you could just really feel it. You could feel the salt water in the air, you know, like you can just, (laughs) it just feels like a gross, grimy seaside town, you know? And yeah, the script is just really tight. The pacing is great. It feels like a, like a two hour plus movie and it's like an hour and like what, 45 minutes. Yeah. Something like that. Very breezy. And yeah, I, I think it's, it's great. And like you guys said, you know, it seems like kind of like low hanging fruit, but you you really can't look at the early Brando stuff and not just take a moment and comment on how there is a reason he was like the most influential actor ever. Yeah, sure. There's a reason things changed after him. You know, that that's not a coincidence. It's um, it's there. It's on screen. You could feel it. You can see it. Yeah, I. Jump in real quick. I was, I was watching a one of the special features um, shortly before recording, and it was Martin Scorsese talking about this film. And he was, I think he was kind of speaking personally, but I think it kind of applies. But he was saying that you know there was like Citizen Kane was transformational, and then On the Waterfront was the next, like one of the next big like transformational movies, and uh, mm-hmm. because of Brando, so he he kind of compared it to how Citizen Kane changed the way movies were lit and shot and made. Yeah. You know, one of the things I, I watched um, the the bold and the beautiful, the Kirk Douglas movie about the producer, uh, and when I, I when I watched that one, uh, Kirk Douglas actually reminds me of Brando, it, just in the way he outshines all the other actors. Like he's so much more naturalistic than all the other actors, you know. Uh, and in fact, Brando also reminds me of James Dean. You know, like of course, East of Eden was also done by Elia Kazan, but like. Especially, I think this character specifically kind of reminds me of James Dean, a James Dean type character. Uh, well, there would be no James Dean without Brando. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so well, James they, they Dean both... kind of doing Brando. Yeah. yeah and we're talking... James Dean in all three of his movies, uh, his big movies, is basically just doing Brando in sure. Streetcar. Which is also <laughs> the method. You know, like James Dean was definitely all about that. The Stella Adler. But here's the thing about acting. Brando and the method that you keep talking about. Brando didn't seem to just be in character. He seemed wildly unprofessional and and going off script a lot and sure. like didn't remember his lines. It feels like, you know, whenever I think of like method and like the actors that are known for it, like Daniel Day Lewis, it seems like, yeah, maybe there's some improv here and there, but it seems like they care about the subject matter more than Brando does. <laughs> Brando, it seems like he's like this enigma. Because he's so good and he's so magnetic and everyone loves to watch him. But it seems like no one liked working with him. Sure. Um, yeah. Brenda's interesting. And, and I guess I, 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 the method I, I, we should, I should explain is also like Daniel Day-Lewis uh, is different than um, like the Stella Adler method. It's kind of in the same family. But like, you know, I don't think Brando necessarily went around uh being in character like the method is more like about using your past memories and drudging up like oh my sister used to hit me when i was a kid and using that as an acting uh that method does that make sense sure but i just don't know that i i get that vibe from brando i mean i just based on like the the stories i hear on set but i mean i guess you would know more than i but it seems like more than anything part of the appeal of brando is the unexpected nature of like what what brando are you going to get sure <laughs> you like, know and it seems like as as his career went on he got more like wildly unprofessional and and diminishing returns on the performances i, I think a good example yeah. of that especially in his later career is you get francis ford coppola with the godfather and then francis ford coppola with apocalypse now they're both good performances it's just that one you know took months to film yeah. and then the and other then, one then eventually you get Marlon Brando and Stanley 
What's the guy's name who was going to do Island of Dr. Moreau? Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, man, I can't remember his name. But... Donan? Stanley? No, that's Donan? Uh, Stanley Donan's Singing in the Rain director. Oh, that's oh. right. <laughs> what is his name? It's like... <sighs> anyway, <laughs> Island of Lost Souls, if you guys ever want to just realize like how low Brando sunk professionally by the end of his life. Mm-hmm. Um, crazy documentary about the Island of Dr. Moreau from the 90s. Richard Stanley. Stanley is his last Richard name. Stanley. Oh, okay. nice. I knew Stanley was in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But anyways, yeah. So Brando is like a, a fascinating figure, and especially the early Brando. You yes. know, like the like Streetcar the 50s Desire. era Brando. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, I love watching him in this movie and, and literally seeing the difference between, you know, People who are great, like Carl Malden and um, Lee J. Cobb, and even um, Eva Marie Saint, I think. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a there's a showiness, or, or say like a, it's almost like a, a cadence. Yeah, that sounds like performing. That, that they're old Hollywood giving. Uh, inflection style with your words and your delivery. Yeah. Like it's not bad, but it's very stilted in old Hollywood yeah. style. Yeah, it works. I mean, like I, I love Cary Grant, and I like you know I like John Wayne movies and and whatnot, and they're very much part of that. So yeah, it's not a bad thing by any means. It's just a different style, and it works. It does work. <laughs> but and to see them up kind of up against each other, it's it's really interesting. It's cool. Yeah, I completely agree. So Chris, yes. Were there any surprises in this movie? What do you what what stuck out to you the most? What were like? I mean, because you this is one of those movies that if you know movies, if you've watched things, if you've acted, if you've whatever, you know, if you've watched documentaries about movies, if you've listened to interviews, like this movie comes up. You sure. know this movie, you've seen scenes from it, like you said. But were there any surprises for you? Is there anything that you didn't see coming, or were taken aback by by how good it was, or how? different it was in your brain or how bad it was you know like what what was your experience like watching this for the first time versus your expectations um i think solaris was a much different experience uh this one because i hadn't watched a lot of it i i think this one had had pretty much already been spoiled for me um and, and not in a bad way you know like it's in a class or whatever that i'm watching it you know you gotta expect that kind of thing but I think I kind of knew everything that was happening uh, that was going to happen. You know, I, I don't know that I was necessarily surprised. I was upset when all the pigeons got killed. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I did not see that coming. That little kid throwing the dead pigeon at him was uh, pretty heart wrenching. Um, I, I think. Yeah, the main thing I take away is the the Brando performance. Um, I, I also like that last sequence, I guess, too, would be. Well, it's kind of weird, I, and I don't know exactly how I feel, and you guys can talk. So Brando marches down, and he's like, I'm going to go try to get work, even though they told me n- never to come down there again, and they might kill me, right? So he goes down there. Uh, all the workers turn their back on him. And then kind of about five minutes later, they all are kind of defending him. Uh, and so I was interested in that. And it was, you know, like that's after when he starts getting beat up, they all kind of are, are defending him, and then he marches in. Uh, and they all go to work with him. Uh, it's definitely, there's certainly a, a Jesus metaphor in there, uh, like resurrection. It's very Catholic. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I think that was probably maybe the most surprising and the most interesting that I, uh, part of what I found. Um, I, I All their faces, especially, you know, like that's one other thing. The casting is really good. They all look like, uh, I imagine, um, people that work on the waterfront look like uh except marlon brando except, yeah, except for marlon brando who looks <laughs> like he should be riding a motorcycle or something um yeah i don't even know that marlon brando necessarily looks like a boxer except for he has that little like scar yeah. on his eye um but yeah anyways uh that's kind of what i take away from it i i, I just don't know that I, I i think it was as if i had seen it before does that make sense yeah it's a very straightforward movie yeah and I'd yeah. seen so many chunks of it and heard people talk about it that it it, it didn't and feel you've seen, new. Yeah, yeah, you've seen riffs on this script remade into later movies that you, you know, sure. have watched. Yeah. And th- there's yeah. actually a movie 
that I want to get into, and we'll talk about it later. Uh, like High Noon, I think is you know because I I watch this comparison of High Noon and On the Waterfront, and and that's actually a more fascinating thing to me than than almost the movie itself because it's Elijah Kazan talking about his experience, uh, like in front of the House of Un American Activities, and him like naming names, and then you have High Noon where it's like about the same thing except for not naming names and they both are isolated uh, and alone <laughs> you know I, I find that very interesting like it doesn't matter what you do you're going to end up isolated and alone you know uh, I, I i find that interesting yeah well i think the the thing the thing that maybe takes me out of the movie the most i, I guess is thinking about that context of this movie of him talking about it and and with what you're saying is of how you know Nobody, nobody seems to really be on his side. And then he goes down and he stands up and he starts fighting and then everyone's kind of standing with him. Right. Yeah. And all of a sudden. Yeah. All of a sudden. And that feels, it feels a bit like, um, maybe some wishful thinking or like an ideal situation for, uh, Ilya Kazan, you know, cause, uh, I think he is. I mean, I guess I don't necessarily know how he was received at the time, but I know, you know, he's pretty controversial for what he did, but, um, sure. That seems like what he thinks people should do of like, yeah, you didn't like that. I named names, but Hey, maybe you will, maybe you should, <laughs> maybe you should yeah. be on my side. I, I guess that's, that was actually the biggest surprise. I watched the movie <laughs> and I was like, Oh man, this is a good movie. And then I watched that special feature and I was like, I saw it in a whole new light. And I was like, oh man, I don't, it's still a good movie, but if maybe I don't like what Aliyah Kazan's trying to say, <laughs> you know, there's a difference between, you know, naming names of people in the mob that are like literally breaking the law and naming names of people that are a part of a political party, you know? Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> For sure. He definitely sees himself as a hero where I don't necessarily think it's the same thing. Yeah. And I, and I don't think that I was quite aware of that situation the first time or two that I watched this and like in a vacuum that that doesn't bother me. And I think it's just, uh, I, I don't have really have any complaints about the movie. <laughs> sure. One way or the other. It's just weird to think about. Yeah. Mike, any thoughts on that? No, not really. Not anything new that yeah. wouldn't be treading the same ground, you know? Um, gotcha. I, I guess I would say that, yeah, when you first watch movies and you're first getting into movies, at least me, you know, I I knew what the House of Un-American Activities Committee was, but I don't think I understood the the greater implications around it or had a fully formed opinion on it. <laughs> sure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that even now I, I am hesitant to give my full opinion because I, I wasn't there. I wasn't alive and I, and I don't know all the nuance and context around all of that, but I do know that I, I'm kind of with you, which is like, um, Ilya Kazan is a is an extremely talented director, but is like what is he saying, <laughs> you know, uh, with this and like and it may just be like superficial comparisons, you know, to some ways like talking, and obviously it's like who who you talk to and about what matters, and in the story it's very clearly like um, Marlon Brando is the hero in this movie, you know, talking to the law enforcement about trying to stop corruption. I don't know how you pretzel that into like what Ilya Kazan did in his own brain. Like, I don't know if that, if he was thinking to himself that this is a one for one comparison sure, or right. if he was just taking inspiration from certain elements of being alone and feeling like an outcast and feeling hated. I don't mm -hmm. know that this movie is his attempt to justify himself. In the document, I, or I mean, it wasn't a long thing. Um, it was about, you know, 15, 20 minutes long. There was like quotes from him and it seemed like it was a thing that he was trying to justify like in the same way that the, when I've learned about high noon, that author was like, this is what my experience was like, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, it was kind of, he was saying the same thing. This is what my experience was like. I didn't 
like those communists anymore is what he said so i didn't have a problem telling on you know naming their names uh and and you're right i think mike in (laughs) it's easy for us to you know pass judgment um not having been there or had to deal with the certain same situations uh i mean i think i know kind of where i fall but um i think life is gray you know and i think actually in both high noon and this movie, I wish there had been a little bit more gray uh, in On the Waterfront, where like, as, as opposed to black and white. But I, I don't think that's what Elia Kazan was trying to say, if that makes sense. Right. I will say, if I can change the subject. Sure, please. Yeah, because I think we've got that. But yeah, <laughs> the guy who just kept saying definitely in the background <laughs> kept making me laugh. <laughs> Uh, in a movie <laughs> thank you in uh-huh. a movie kind of void of a lot of comedic Laughs. relief <laughs> yeah well apparently he's grateful a lot of these characters were based on real people yeah yeah like uh, uh like uh um, something uh even carl malden's character was based on a real priest from the local area mm-hmm. it says I think this somewhere in the credits, like stories were suggested by articles by Malcolm Johnson, which I didn't really like look up who that was. Um, but I, yeah, so I guess it's journalism on real people that probably inspired a lot of this. So that's cool. Apparently, yeah. according to IMDb's trivia section, uh, Paul Newman was used to lure Marlon Brando into accepting this role because Paul Newman was an up and comer at this time. And Marlon Brando was notoriously competitive. <laughs> that sounds so about right. That would have been interesting to see a Paul Newman uh, version yeah. of On the Waterfront. What would that have been like? Well, he's another one of those actors that I think is much more natural, naturalistic uh, in style. So Yeah, Paul yeah. Newman's great. Although I don't think that he's nearly as influential of an actor as Marlon Brando, I would say that Paul Newman is a better actor, I think, than Marlon Brando. Yeah, yeah maybe a, yeah, overall. More consistent career as well. Yeah. yeah. Certainly a cooler guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Would Paul Newman be Marlon Brando? Not not in like terms of what he went on to do, but the way we consider Marlon Brando as changing acting. Yeah, do you just need a naturalistic would... actor in this part in order no, to change I mean, acting? I think, I think Brando hit the right place at the right time. But also, I think Brando, this isn't the movie that I think that did it right. Brando had already begun to change things with streetcar. Right. True. At this That's point, fair. he was sought after. He was, he was hot stuff. Um, he's 30 here. I didn't realize. I thought he was, uh, younger, but yeah, I guess you can kind of tell with the hairline a little bit. Yeah. And they say it, they say you're almost 30. Well, <laughs> they say almost 30, but he was 30. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I mean, the the scene with him uh, and Eva Marie Saint in the park where he sits on the swing and he's talking to her and he's just like playing with the glove, like yeah. putting oh, her yeah. glove on. Apparently um, that was uh, improv in rehearsal because she dropped her glove and he picked it up and, and did that with it. And then the director was like, do that again. Yeah. <laughs> and let's film it. Yeah. It's great. He's I think he's he's really charming. Yeah. And that's the kind of naturalism that we're talking about here, right? And also what's so great about that is like they're walking and they sit on the swing or he sits on the swing and she kind of leans and talks for a minute. And then they start walking again and the camera starts moving with them. And it's set the subtle movements that I think uh, is a, it's a deft hand in a, at a directing, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it gives yeah. like this film in a way that a lot of early – uh, Hollywood studio films, especially in this era, it gives it like a, a movement that you don't really feel a lot. And maybe that's because they are shooting on location so they, they can get the backgrounds and they can get natural blocking in a way that maybe you couldn't do on sets. Sure. But, yeah. I mean, but in a lot of ways, space, you feel it. Yeah. Yeah. This is kind of a precursor to, you know, <laughs> The French New Wave, you know, uh, which isn't for a little while, but you start this. That's what the French New Wave and all those things are, is like naturalistic on 
uh, not on set, on location as opposed to on a set. So you can do yeah. these things that looks real. Uh, and it, it definitely gives yeah. the movie... Well, it gives this. It makes the city a character. Yeah, as opposed to if it was on yeah. a set, you'd have like matte paintings in the background, right. you know, uh, things like that, which I, I've got no problem with. I love I love them in a way, you know. But this one, it certainly sets this movie apart from the others, yeah. and especially at this time. Yeah. Well, of of movies of this time period, I'm also reminded of Roman Holiday did that a lot, like yeah, yeah, taking the camera out and just filming in streets and filming in real places. Yeah. Right. Well, especially and, if you're going to go to Rome. Think, <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, of Rome, I, I will say, too, that I'm not a, a film history expert, but uh, the Italian uh, neorealist movement yeah, was absolutely. around this time, a little bit before this movie. And I think you can feel the influence uh, on this film in that way. Like, it did remind me of some of the scenes, just the feeling of things like Bicycle Thieves. Yeah, that were shot on location. You know, like how and a dirty lot of... everyone is, and just how like the faces are so sunken in sometimes and very real. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And again, that's it's, it's one of those things that sets this film apart. And on top of the acting thing, to me, just kind of makes it. I don't know that this was the only <laughs> film doing this or anything like that at the time, but it was just part of. You could just see the the shift in the language yeah. of film. I think the sea change. Mm -hmm. and on that same note uh chris you were talking about the aspect ratios earlier um and i i noticed when i bought the on the waterfront uh, edition that it has um, three different versions of the movie that you could watch um one is in 1.66 to 1 aspect ratio um which is like almost 16 by 9 like if you have a normal widescreen tv it's almost the full thing but there's little black stripes on the side that's what uh, i watched the, it in. yeah that's how we watch on it, hbo yeah. max yeah yeah I, I watched that version uh on the criterion edition uh but the there's a second disc and it has the film in 1.33 to 1 which is the normal like square academy format and there's also a, a 1.85 to 1 widescreen version so it's gonna have like black at the top and bottom right mm -hmm. and um i wasn't entirely sure why this existed you know Mm -hmm. And I think I, or I was watching a thing and, it, and it, to my understanding, the there was a controversy a bit about like, what's the true way to see this film? Uh, because it came out around the time that uh, movie studios were trying to compete with TV. Oh. And so that's when they when they were starting to introduce widescreen um, and Vista Vision and CinemaScope and all that stuff. And it was a, a thing a thing where when they shot the movie, they shot it with all three in mind. So they had like lines while they were shooting and made sure the frame would work for, uh, you know, 1.66, 1.33, and then 1.85. Uh, and make sure that, you know, in the, in the one where you see the most from top to bottom, you're not seeing any equipment. Um, and same. And I mean, I think that's kind of a, a testament that like the film works and, in all three aspect ratios and that they had to consider that just makes it even harder, like considering they were shooting on location and yeah, um, yeah. it's just like an added, an added layer, but it was kind of dependent on the projection and the theater and what the theater could handle in terms of widescreen or, or 1.66 or 1.33, like however it was projected. Yeah. Um, and then I think obviously on TV, when the film started playing, um, it was 1.33. So a lot of people saw it that way. And so, I guess what's cool is Criterion gave you the option so you can watch it in your favorite way, however you choose, because it I works in if, all of them. Yeah, I wonder if uh, the director, if Kazan had a favorite version of it. Like, is it the same takes in every version? Like, Yeah, I think it's it's literally just cropped differently. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like they shot, you know, different takes for different aspect ratios. I think it's just... Yeah. Um, they shot it one way aware of where it would be cropped. So like, you know, you don't shoot the widest or the, the tallest angle sure. too close so that when you crop it to widescreen, too much of their face is cut off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I will say that the, the transfer that exists on HBO max, which I assume is the criterion transfer, uh, looks great. It's very crisp, very clean. There's not a shot in there that doesn't look 
really sharp. Yeah, agreed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I I assume it's the same transfer that I have on Blu-ray, which looks great. Um, yeah. So the um, th- there's a lot of scenes that are shot through chicken wire. Yes. And um, I I like that touch of how much we see Brando like inside. Mm-hmm. You know, just thinking of his character as because with his brother being involved, I mean, he's basically has no choice. <laughs> Throughout the entire movie, right, um, and I think it's just this nice little uh, thematic, like a uh, visual theme that we keep revisiting. Um, and another thing, and it's you know, it's it doesn't feel forced because the pigeon coops are, are a thing and they're real, and um, it doesn't feel out of place. Sure, yeah, it's like that. It's a nice visual, I guess, motif that is reoccurring throughout the movie. That's subtle, but also uh, it's not that subtle. But but it works, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's, it's a bit imprisoned, but it's um, maybe subtle back then when no one was on the lookout for that kind of thing. It accentuates their points. I I, I think it looks good. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. I wasn't ever like, oh God, he's behind another chicken wire. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> come on, man. How many times are you gonna do this? I get it. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Some yeah. directors like to film through doorways and windows. And yeah. <laughs> Some mm-hmm. like chicken wire. Yeah. And well, fences they... too. I mean, there's also like not just chicken wire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bars of fences, like that uh, wrought iron. Is that wrought iron? Is the right kind of fence? I don't know. You know, the uh, one that they're cast iron. I don't know. Yeah, they're the one that they're standing next to, and they're you know they're talking and observing. Yeah, the city's in the background. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that where that's where um, Carl Malden is as the priest. Is he's standing when he um, he's watching Brando. Tell mm-hmm. her. Well, he's talking to Brando, and then Brando leaves, and he gets down the yeah. hill real fast. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Comically fast. Yeah. Um, like I think he booked it down the hill, like ran really fast. Yeah. Actually, there's there's two times in this movie where we skip over Brando explaining the situation to somebody. You know, the the first time is to Carl Malden. You know, we just kind of see them walking away and see Brando gesturing like he's talking. And mm-hmm. then we cut to, you know, I guess well, maybe a little bit later. Or doesn't even seem like a little bit later. It seems like immediately thereafter. Yeah. And then we get him like, okay, he's already explained everything. And I, and I get the, the more important one to me is that we kind of skip over most of his explanation uh, to Edie. Yeah. That was the weirdest choice. Uh, upon rewatch this time, I was like, "We're really not going to see this scene, huh?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and you're just going to put a horn over it, which I I, th- I found it interesting because I think that was supposed to be like her mindset, right? You know, like that's that horn is her reaction in her in her head to what he's saying, right? Yeah, it's like the emotion o- overcoming the, an ability to listen. Yeah, and to understand and hear. Yeah. That's what I, how I took which, it. Yeah. yeah, I like that. A lot, uh, actually, like in terms of sound design. I just found it like I want to see that scene. I want to sure. see him explain it just in. Well, it's maybe the that's tension, because right? of Brando. It's, it's the scene we're waiting on. We're waiting for that shoe to drop. Yeah. Yeah. And we kind of don't get it. And I just found that really interesting. Yeah. Like, I, I don't know if it's an economic choice. Like, like <laughs> well, we saw the scene when it happened. We know how he feels. We don't yeah, need I don't to know hear if him say like a pacing it. thing where they're just like, we all know what he did. <laughs> Yeah, we don't, we need, don't to need to him to explain it again an hour and yeah. And all we really need is her reaction to it, right? <laughs> you know, and so we put a horn over it and see how she's reacting. That might be. It's it's true in a purely like talking about efficiency sense. Sure, I would still have. I would still like to see that scene. Yeah, because <laughs> Brando's so good that sure. I think it would have been a good scene and well acted and intense yeah I agree because that definitely stood out to me too as a strange choice uh, and and probably my biggest criticism if you could even call it that because the movie I mean it gets where it needs to go I, we get everything we need but yeah I mean it just seemed like an odd choice because I don't know. I wanted more from her character in general, really. But 
that, you know, yeah. it's not her movie. Apparently, sure. she was submitted as a supporting actress so she'd have a better chance of winning an Oscar, even though the role qualified as lead actress. So the same thing's been going on for a long time. Category fraud. <laughs> yep. Politicking. Yeah. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, uh, did you guys like the soundtrack at all? Or what did you guys think? Because it's it's Leonard Bernstein, the same guy that did like the uh, uh, West Side Story music. Mostly, uh, I wasn't unbothered by it. I thought it fit. It's kind of that that jazzy yeah. sort of yeah, thing I'm not, going on. Yeah, I'm not good enough at recognizing score to say it stood out to me. Yeah, I mean, that's per mainly the, the, the thing. That <laughs> but I notice. guess that's also a good thing because yeah. nothing stood out to me as bad. Yeah, did you it's notice just, it, I guess, or did it yeah, just kind of fly under the radar? There, there was a moment, I think. I think it's... I, I wish I could remember it more specifically. Um, but... I do remember thinking the score seemed out of place. I think it was during the church scene whenever the, they start like fighting at the very and, beginning. Like, the people, when they have the meeting. Yeah, but yeah, when they're having the meeting and then the the thing gets thrown through the window and then everyone's trying to run out and they're getting beat with like bats and pipes. Yeah, I, I think, think that's when it, it was that sounded scene. the most. It sounded kind of like West Side Story. There was a point where I was like. Maybe not like West Side Story, but it sounded like the start to a musical or something like that. I don't know. It it, it sounded like it sounded like make this scene intense or like isn't this such an intense scene? Like listen to this music. Can you believe how intense this is? And it just seemed a little <laughs> in my face. A little too much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It seemed a little over the top, and and might have been. I don't know. Might have been better as letting letting the violence itself be the loudest part of the scene, sure. so to speak. Yeah. But that was the only. I just remember it standing out. I think. I think it was that time. Makes sense. All right. All right. Anything else? Do we have anything else we want to say about this movie? I'm good. I don't. No. I'm good. I'm ready yeah. to name names. Yeah, I'm sure that's you are. <laughs> the, the names of Criterion movies for our next poll, I hope. That's what I was... That was my point. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. And with that, uh, let's see. So, the next theme to choose our next Casually Criterion episode or, or review, we are each going to choose a personal favorite film from the Criterion Collection that we have not yet reviewed on the show. Yes. All right. So who wants to kick us off on this? I started us off on the movie, so Chris. All right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think the movie I am going to go with, because we really haven't done uh, very many from this director, um, Wild Strawberries from Ingmar Bergman. I think I've actually nominated this one before, uh, but we, we didn't do it. So... I'm nominating Wild Strawberries again. Okay. All right. Good yeah. movie. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. I watched this not that long ago. Just yeah, me randomly too. Actually, one day. Actually, yeah. <laughs> it, nice. Really I haven't good. seen it since I first again. saw it, but right. I remember it well. Yeah, Mike, uh, what are you going to recommend? Okay. So this is a film that is one of the first Criterion films that I bought, I want to say. And I've watched it and it was really super awesome. And I've been wanting to dive back into it. I still remember certain scenes from it. It's awesome. I am talking about Carol Reed's The Third Man. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. Yeah, I would like to watch that again. I'm... <laughs> Fun yeah. fact about this movie, which is actually not about the movie. It's about me. But <laughs> <laughs> I watched this this movie, I think at your recommendation, Mike, like maybe you let me borrow your copy or you'd be like, I bought it and it's good. And so I bought it, yeah. but I watched it. And literally two days later, I was playing a trivia game or something with somebody. And, yeah. um, the opening line of the third man, like it, it was the question gave, like, what movie is this the opening line from? And it was from the third man. Oh yeah. It was awesome. like the, like <laughs> I never knew the old streets of Vienna or something. Yeah. Um, 
But since I had just watched the movie, I was like, oh, the third man. And everyone was like, who are you? you It's a real like, yeah, it was like Slumdog Millionaire moment. Um, Anyways. Good choice. Yeah. Good fact about you. That one's going to win, too, I think. Depending on what Justin picks. (laughs) Moment of truth. Um, Armageddon. (laughs) (laughs) No. Um, So, yeah, I I have a lot of favorites, honestly, that like movies that I think were either in my top 10 or really close to like my top 10 when we did that episode that are on Criterion that we haven't talked about. Um, So I have a really hard choice, (laughs) but I think I'm going to go down the more fun route of things, in my opinion. Yeah. You think? I think I know what you're going to pick. Yeah, it's a, a director we haven't done on the podcast at all, I don't think. Um, but it's Jacques Tati, and it's Monsieur Hulot's Holiday, um, an all-time favorite of mine. I think it's just kind of a wonderful film that only gets better every time I watch it. So this would probably be like my 10th time to see it, too. Awesome. Nice. So then you yeah. should be able to lead a fantastic review of that if it wins. All the details from Justin on that yeah. one. Yep, I, I've dive. got them all. We could literally we could, we'll talk about the movie frame by frame, and Ooh. it'll be a two hour podcast. But from memory, you can do it from yeah, memory. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like I won't do it intentionally. It's just I will. I know the movie so well. <laughs> You'll just start just before you know it. it. Yeah, frame one. <laughs> do you remember the first frame, and then there was the second frame? <laughs> what do you make of that dog in the road? Yeah, everything's just a little bit further than it was the frame before. <laughs> all right <laughs> cool. all right that was a great joke uh all right so yes that uh, poll will be on our twitter account the link will be in the show notes go vote for monsieur hulo's holiday right now but we yes. know you're gonna vote for third man so that's okay yeah which yeah. that's fine because that's good because i <laughs> picked that one yeah all good really i mean that was to me that was the benefit of choosing this theme yeah <laughs> sure there's not Unless a bad oftentimes just in... there's not a bad choice though yeah, or there's, there's an unknown choice sometimes. That's true. That we just none of us have seen or something, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, but anyways, is that it for this episode? It is. It is. All right. Well, thank you, listeners, so much for listening, and of course, as always, thank you, Jake Wagner Russell, for doing our intro and outro music. If you want to hear more of his music, you can do so at SoundCloud.com/slash Bobscotch. Stay tuned to this feed, like, subscribe, all that stuff. Our next episode will be... Oh, I forgot about this until... <laughs> <laughs> we just now. This is exciting. Our next episode is going to be yeah. the Titanic re-release for the 25th anniversary. So that means I'm going to theaters to see Titanic again. Yeah, that's right. It's, it's following the theme of movies that somehow Chris hasn't seen before. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like on the waterfront. That's, yeah, buried the lead. Chris hasn't seen Titanic. It's his first yeah. time. Stay tuned to next week, and I'll tell you why I haven't seen it, because there's a very particular story as to why. And, it, you know, this is like 20 years later. I, I'm finally going to do it, and I'm finally going to see it in the theater. So There's boobs in it. He couldn't see boobs when it yeah. came out. Well, I, Chris is I actually always, on a boat. With that boobs, sank I always once. covered one eye, because I didn't want to go blind. So you just cover one eye um, until I that was we always have That we always have one good eye yeah. <laughs> in worst case scenario. <laughs> yeah. So one that's okay. All right. Anyways. <laughs> All right, guys. Titanic. Thanks so much for listening. Uh, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.